How do you feel when you hear the word miscegenation? How does it make you feel? What do you think? I think it sounds really clinical and impersonal, and it's certainly not a word I want to be described as. <laughs> so our guest tonight is an amazing writer, and she decided she doesn't like that word too much either, miscegenation. It's rooted in a pretty wicked history, and it has all kinds of negative connotations. So Tonight, we are about to talk about writers having the power to name ourselves, rewrite our stories, and essentially rewrite culture. <laughs> Welcome to Writer Talks. I'm Elizabeth Ann Atkins, and here at Two Sisters Writing and Publishing, we celebrate the monthly winners of our short story contest by interviewing them here on this show. Here, as a writer, you get to learn all kinds of fascinating peaks into the writer's life, and it's really fun, informative, and inspiring. So tonight, you're in for a treat because Aliyah Harian, coming to us live from Iowa, is about to talk about her winning story, Explaining, explaining Miscegenation to My Son. It's such a good piece. Please go over to twosisterswriting.com slash winning stories and read her story. And right now, I am so proud to welcome you, Aliyah Harian. Welcome. Hi, thank you. So let's talk about your story and your, your life, your family, your personal identity, and what inspired you to write this great piece. Yeah, so um, I was born and raised, I still am in my hometown. It's a middle, small middle sized town, about 60,000 in Iowa. Um, I was primarily raised by my mother's side. And so um, I was raised by white people and I had never kind of had that conversation as a kid. Like I knew that I was a little darker than everyone around me. Um, but as I was growing into that awareness growing up, no one really had that conversation with me. It became the family joke, things like that. Me and my brother always called ourselves the black sheep. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just kind of a thing that wasn't talked about. And I felt a lot of confusion growing up around it, but I didn't have anywhere to kind of discuss that. And so I just thought that maybe I was the weird person and I internalized those feelings for a really long time. Um, but I actually took a Native American course in my undergrad and um, a lot of that literature was um, mixed race artists. And so I was reading these books and it was this huge epiphany in my life because I was like, oh my goodness, my feelings are on a page. And it was a huge turning point for me. And so um, it hasn't been the easiest turning point because it's also kind of met with backlash from my white family members. And so there's love there. And, you know, it's my mother, my aunt, they raised me. And so there isn't hate there, but it is a really difficult topic to, to discuss because it's just not met with understanding. Wow, that's fascinating. Oh my goodness. So mixed race people in America are the fastest growing segment of our population, according to the most recent census. So how does it, it's really disturbing that it's difficult. And I understand it's awkward, it's painful to talk about something that's such an important part of so many people's lives, especially children forming their identities. So how have you taken it upon yourself as a writer to explain this to the world and open up those conversations? I just, I really, I've always really liked working in CNF. Well, I started with poetry as a kid, but um, once I kind of wanted to expand, it's, it's been more of CNF because I've used writing as a tool for me. It's a therapeutic tool. And so, I get the emotion behind it or I see an injustice in the world and that's what I want my writing to be about. And a lot of times an idea will kind of start as like a journal prompt and then I'll say something in my journal that's supposed to just be me venting and then I'm like, oh wait, I can explore this here. Um, or kind of, you know, with this piece that we're looking at today and discussing, I was talking to my sister-in-law in which I married a black man. And so my sister-in-law was black and we were talking about just kind of the area we're in because 
in context, I'm also in Iowa. And so it's not the diverse place on, you know, in America in the first place. So, um, so we were kind of talking about that in the way um, our town kind of treats um, interracial couples or things like that. And where that sort of self-hate comes from as black women. And so I was like, you know, I, I'm came from, you know, people from different worlds and I still want to tell my son to date a black woman. Like, and I feel bad for that because I'm literally a product of it. Um, and she kind of just agreed with me, you know, she's black. And so she didn't have to think too much on it, but that when I said it, I kind of mulled on it for a couple of days and it, I was, obsessed with writing this piece after that because I was like yeah I have to figure this out so wow fascinating and did writing it help you figure it out yes I think so yes um I have my family has not most of my family has not read it yet my dad has read it and a couple of my cousins um (laughs) on my white side have read it um and one of the things that's kind of one of the things my cousin, she's a lawyer in California and she had kind of told me, she's like, you know, I understand your piece and I think it's really good writing, um, but she's also in a mixed race relationship. And so um, she's married to a black man and she was like, I just feel like it's really closed minded. And I understood where she was coming from because she's, but she's also in a different place. You know, she's in San Diego. She's in a really diverse place. Yeah. They're not thinking about it as much as people who are in Iowa are thinking about it. And so yeah. um, it didn't cause any bitterness between us, but I think there was an a, a agree to disagree moment because I could see how that would be offensive to her as me not wanting my black son to marry a white woman or be with a white woman. And it's not that, that's my solid standpoint. This was, and I never wanted this to come off that way either. It was more of, I feel this and this is why I feel it and it shouldn't be this way. Um, but, and that's why I put it in the epistolary form is so it could be that more kind of personal figuring out of myself. Mm. So what is the reason for your son? The, I'm sorry. What is the reason you wouldn't want him to marry a white woman? Just because I can, I have had struggles in my marriage because I was raised by white people. And honestly, through most of my teens and early adulthood, I would try to identify as white. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we can all see that I'm not quite passing complexion by any means, but, um, and so a lot of the, misunderstandings that me and my husband have had was because of the mindset that I had. Um, I kind of, I think I referred to it in this piece as a white vision um, is what I call it. And so once I kind of started exploring that and understanding that more and kind of putting all of the microaggressions and instances that I kind of try to shrug off in my early adulthood, it made sense. And so it was more of, this is where I fell short from understanding my husband as someone who didn't have your typical black upbringing. Um, And so I don't want another woman to fall short for my son. Wow. Fascinating. That's so interesting. So would you like to read a segment of the piece? Sure. Okay, great. If the woman you bring home respects you, holds you up in this world as a man, keeps you in check when you need to be because you men tend to not think clearly sometimes and makes you happy, well, damn it, I love her for you. But as soon as my side of the family would Sorry, but as much as my side of the family would hate to hear it spoken, I prefer she be a beautiful brown woman. I can't say that out loud without offending someone's son. So we'll keep that between me and you. But let me try to explain why. And maybe your mama won't sound like such a hypocrite. When I started identifying more as black than white or mixed, your Nana had a problem with that. I was a product of her. And this wasn't no slave days where the best she could hope for was for me to be a house slave because the child followed the path of the mama. I guess that would be assuming the mom would keep you around back then. 
No, no, I was her baby and raised by her white family, so claiming my blackness was a direct offense to her. Although that was never my intention, we've had plenty of screaming matches, her and I, because as much as I knew she loved me, your uncle, and your grand granddaddy, she just couldn't grasp the concepts I was trying to explain. After yet another incident of police brutality followed by protests which led into riots, she had the nerve to focus on the riots as most people who wanted to ignore the systematic racism would. She said to me, I just don't understand why they think riots will solve anything. Now son, I am not a fan of violence and destruction, but when a person doesn't feel heard or understood, they fight to try and get their point across. I told her, think of a toddler who is trying to communicate their needs, but the parent isn't understanding a tantrum begins. Now is a tantrum a positive thing? Of course not, but it's the result of failing to be understood. That's what black people have been feeling in this country since the beginning. She followed with a but, and I knew our conversation wasn't going anywhere. She even had the nerve to tell me that I wasn't black. We didn't speak for a while after that conversation. Here's the thing, son. I might be a light brown. Hell, you're a light brown. But the racist crossing the street doesn't see the light, he just sees the brown. And the HR lady doesn't see the black and white or two or more races checked on my application. She just sees my natural curls and thinks it looks messy. This world has a deep rooted love of racism and various forms of systematic oppression. And even the most well-intentioned white woman can never understand you the way she may need to in a given circumstance, could never understand you, certain decisions she should make for the children you may have. Imagine y'all get pulled over and she's driving. She asks you to get her registration out the glove compartment. The poor girl don't think nothing of it. She just needs to give it to the officer, right? But as he's getting out of his car, he sees a black man reaching for something. And next thing you know, you're staring down the barrel of a gun with a man shouting in your face. And that's if they don't, I shudder at the thought. Woo, <laughs> that's really deep. I understand now. I, I understand better um, where you're coming from and it's rooted in your relationship with your mother. It's really fascinating. Really, it's such a painful issue for so many people and there's so much fear around it, especially as a mother. So, wow, powerful, powerful, powerful. Your kids are too young to read it. They probably can't read, well, maybe they can read, but they wouldn't understand it yet because they're so young. But do you intend for them to read it someday? For sure. I um, I guess with them being so little right now, my son's only two, and so I don't imagine him dating at all yet. But <laughs> um, but I would assume when the time comes for a serious relationship, not middle school boyfriend girlfriend stuff, but for a serious relationship, it would be something that I would refer back to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then at one point you mentioned your father. So did he show back up or was he always around? He was always ish around. <laughs> um, when I was a toddler, he did move back um, to Minnesota. And so there were a few years where I seen him. I don't remember really. Um, there were kind of those years that you don't have in your memory, but I know that I went back and forth. Um, but even when he did move back to Iowa, when me and my sister were seven, um, he was just one of those people that had a lot of jobs and was always working and wasn't really around around for me to have that relationship, for me to have that conversation. Um, my stepfather, he was um, and that's actually who I'm referring to in the piece when I say granddaddy is my stepfather, because for the longest time, um, I would have called him my father. Um, but that's for a different piece. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he was around, but he was actually one of, I have a, a in my MFA right now, I'm working on a craft paper um, on biracial identity. And my opening line is, you ain't black, you ain't white, you ain't confused. Mm -hmm. And so my stepfather was black from the south side of Chicago. Um, that's how my brother is mixed. We don't have the same father. But um, he would always make that joke as I was growing up. And it was literally, it's like the soundtrack of my identity now that I kind of process it. And so it was funny then. And then as I grew up, I'm like, it's not that funny because I really am confused. <laughs> and I really have a lot of 
crap to work out now. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So you had a black stepfather while growing up, but did he provide you with any insight? Not none. <laughs> none. Um he was kind of in and out as well. And so those just weren't um even though I had black people in my life on an inconsistent basis, um, they just weren't there to kind of show me and teach me and have those conversations with me. My stepfather is not really the serious type anyway. So <laughs> you wouldn't expect that from him, even if he was around more. Um, and then my dad is kind of too serious. And I think, and we just had such a strained relationship that I don't think he would have felt comfortable having that conversation with me, to be honest. Um, when he was actually one of the first people to read my first drafts, him and my uncle Vic, because we do have a better relationship now. Um, and I think he kind of had that guilt of not having those conversations. Um, yeah. And so often I've learned, because my mom has had those conversations with my brother. So often I've learned that it's something about me being a woman as well that these conversations weren't had to have weren't How? Had to have, as if I didn't have to be as protected um, my mom has said several times like I never worried about you getting pulled over because you weren't a boy when my brother got to the age of driving and things like that my mom was conscious enough to warn him about it even though she still can't participate in some of the full conversations about it but she was conscious enough, enough to be be careful you know um but she has told me several times she just didn't worry about it because I was a girl wow 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 so now Aaliyah you as a writer are in a position to do two things educate the public at large so that other families can have these conversations and secondly to show other writers that when you have an area that you need for healing and something where you don't like the wording around it like miscegenation uh, which is like a slave term for mixed race people and mixed race mixing um, just like the word mulatto I find very offensive as well um, you have the power as a writer to change the way we write and speak. So can you talk about those two things, please? Um, yes, I, and I know um, those were really strong words in there. And I did that intentionally. Um, one of the earlier drafts actually did have the N word, but I drew a line somewhere. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to, because I am not a big fan of censorship. Um, but I did want to be able to make a point in, in a platform that could reach as many people as possible. And so I did remove that word, but I wanted to use those words just to, to make people think about them more. Most people don't know what the word miscegenation means. And um, to be honest, they might know mulatto, but miscegenation probably not so much. And so it was one of those things that, no, I want you to hear this word because I want you to look it up and then apply to the emotions that are going on in this piece. Um, and then maybe you can think about it differently. And so, um, that was kind of a big thing. I remember I had sent a draft off to one of my friends in undergrad and she was like, are you sure you want to use this word in the title? And I'm like, I sure do. I sure do. <laughs> um, it, I take it as a duty as a writer to really talk about the uncomfortable topics mm -hmm. and how am I going to talk about the uncomfortable topics without um, politely nudging you into your uncomfortability. <laughs> wow, I love that one. That was a pull quote. Was cool. <laughs> politely you. nudging you into your uncomfortability. That's really good. Wow, okay. Um, and then also inspiring other writers to change the lexicon. So you're that's probably not even your mission, but you are doing that as an example. And now that you're earning your MFA and you have a big career as a writer ahead of you, can you talk about the, the power that you have to influence society? Um, yeah, I, that's a humbling question because I've never um, thought about it that much. Um, I am a whirlwind of emotions. And so I just kind of do without really thinking a lot of the time. And like I said, this piece was my baby for a long time. And so of course a lot of thought had went into it, but I didn't think about how that, 
you know, that could potentially um, influence other writers. But um, I just kind of, what I want to encourage other writers is that there is a way to kind of push back. Um, I think we're in this world of cancel culture and things like that, where um, sometimes you're afraid of saying the wrong thing, of doing the wrong thing and things like that. And I think accountability is important, but I also think that pushback is important too, because um, how else are we going to kind of break out of the box and have those conversations? Mm -hmm. And so I think mm, the biggest thing I would want to encourage writers with my writing and plan to encourage writers um, with where I want to go in my MFA and in my future is um, to just kind of be their authentic selves um, and say what they have to say and then have that support system around you. Sensitivity readers are a big thing and they, um, I go to my undergrad a lot, like peers right now a lot uh, because they're the ones that are going to be real with me. Other people are just like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> but a sensitivity reader though, for those who don't know. Um, a sensitivity reader is um, readers just we're general readers. I try to get to people that could potentially be offended. Like with this piece, I sent it to a couple of my white girlfriends that are in relationships with black men. And I was like, all right, do you hate me after reading this? Um, so it's people that you know could come off offense, offended um, by your writing and have them write it, but make sure you trust or read that, sorry, read it and make sure you trust them because um, it's easier to have those conversations with someone that knows you and knows your whole heart than someone that's just surfing the internet and is like, what did she just say? So, right. Um, right. So, yeah. wow, that's powerful. So sensitivity writers are important. So you can understand how this is going to strike people, whether good or bad. So you're prepared for that, but you're very courageous. Like you're just doing your thing. So where do you find that courage and how can other writers who are so worried about how people will react, especially friends or family members, how do you find the courage to just speak from your heart? I felt silenced for so long. Um, kind of as I talked about my whole childhood, I had these feelings that I couldn't discuss and I didn't think they were right. And um, it wasn't good to sit with those for almost 20 years. And so um, my courage is in the fact that I have words to put to my feelings now. I have understanding to put to my feelings now. And I'm going to use them because it ate me up for so long. And it still is. I would still oh. say I'm in this um, identity crisis kind of journey. Um, and I feel more confident in it. But I, it's definitely... I'm catching up because for so long, I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Wow, powerful. You said I was silenced for so long. Wow. So tell me about your big dreams as a writer with your MFA. Do you want to write books? Do you want to be a professor? What's your goal? I do want to write books. That has been when I was like seven, I wanted to be a singer. Um, but I also wanted to be an author. <laughs> and so I don't want to be a singer anymore. I only sing for my children now. Um, but I have always wanted to be an author. Um, I've always enjoyed telling stories. I've always enjoyed poetry. And it's just, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. <laughs> Some people, you know, they have great imagination. So they write their stories. And I'm just like, everything writing is amazing. <laughs> so, um, I am, I have a couple of goals right now. Um, I did originally want to be a professor of English, um, but it's kind of turned itself more into um, an entrepreneurial state. I think I want to open up a literary center in my area um, because one, there's not a lot of outlets for writers in this area, but I know we exist. Um, and two, there's not many that are close to where I am at all. There is one in Minneapolis, which is about five hours away from us, but that's, you know, that's not an hour. That's, that's kind of a day's drive. So um, that is kind of my big goal is to open my own literary center. 
What's a literary center? Um, so they hold workshops, they hold open mics, um, pretty much anything literary. Um, people can take, one of the things that I want to put into it is to have classes for um, underserved youth. And so have them, because writing is so important. And so often we see in that youth that they're not reading at the levels they should, or they're not um, writing at the levels they should. And so I kind of want to have that class that would be probably my building block classes. This is what I want it for. And this is what I want to build around it to encompass an entire environment of liter literacy. But to have that for them and to kind of tell them like, reading and writing is not boring. You know, you can use writing for therapeutic techniques. You can use reading to escape whatever is going on at home. And so to really try to find those connections um, so often, especially black kids are growing up and it's better now but like when I was younger every book I read everyone was white and so oh, right, right. Um, to really make those connections between books and people that look like them um, and people that have lives like them so that they can it would probably be more fun for them if they could actually see themselves in the story yes absolutely absolutely that's what inspired me and Catherine to write books about the mixed race experience. She wrote a young adult series called the Veronica series about a biracial girl who's 14, finding herself in the world. And because when we were little, there was zero, nothing. And there were no role models like Barack Obama or Tiger Woods, Mariah Carey, zero. We had not, nothing. And so it was really, I'm wait, I'm much older than you. So right. <laughs> back right now, like I said, it's the largest growing segment of the population. But back when in the seventies, when we were kids, there were, it was difficult, but that's why as writers, we got carved our, we literally wrote ourselves into American literature and you're doing that too, but it's a new day. It's a new day and the numbers are bigger, but the problem is still there. For is sure. what you're saying. For it's sure. terrible. And because kids grow up, like you said, I didn't have a way to express myself. And that was it's really painful. So I, I really applaud your courage and your mission and all the things you're doing because you're carving a new way for your kids and other kids, especially who will have that open conversation, hopefully inspired by what you're writing. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So what are you working on right now? Um, mainly my thesis and my craft paper. <laughs> oh, okay. So, what's, um, a, what's a craft paper? It is, I am working on, so a craft paper is a larger research paper on how to write kind of a very specific um, part of writing. And so some people focus on world building or point of view or characterization. Um, and mine is kind of a mix of point of view and characterization for the um, biracial identity. I'm calling it the gray areas. Oh, and then okay. the subtitle is writing the biracial identity. And so oh, nice. that's a lot of my time right now. <laughs> that's awesome. That's going to help people too. Yes, I have loved it. And I think I always hated research papers, like an undergrad, I hated research papers. And one of the things my mentor um, through my MFA program had told me was write your story in there too. She said, you can use yourself as part of your reasoning. She's like, just make sure you have your sources. Um, and so after she told me that it was so much easier because it was like, oh yeah, I can connect this story to this experience of my life and then explain it that way. So I am on a roll there, but um, it is taking up a lot of my time right now. That and then uh, my thesis will be due beginning of next semester. And so between the craft paper and my thesis, I am not working on much as of short stories right now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Plus you're a mom, a wife, and you work full time and you yeah. do. Oh my gosh. Yes. Cool. I'm that's trying cool. to do my NaNoWriMo goal this uh, month. Uh -huh. However, and I've been the most consistent that I've ever been. Um, but it's still like 500 words a day or at this uh -huh. because 
I'm just so pulled in different directions, but I'm doing it daily. And so even if I don't make the 50 K word count, I will be proud of myself this month. <laughs> oh, on top of all that you're doing, that's remarkable. 500 words unto itself. So Aliyah Harry, and you are a remarkable young woman. You're doing amazing things. You're blazing trails. You're getting conversations going. You're healing yourself and healing others. So I commend all that you're doing and I wish you the absolute best. You're welcome. So thank you for joining me here on Writer Talks. Everybody, please go over to twosisterswriting.com and check out her winning story. You can type in Aaliyah Harian. You can see her spelling here on the screen and read miscegenation, explaining miscegenation to my son or my young son. And it's so good. It's really powerful. And you heard an excerpt today. So thank you for watching. And please give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel, drop a comment if you have any questions or anything you'd like to share. And also, again, hop over to Two Sisters Writing and Publishing and go to submissions for our contest because you too can submit your story to our contests and perhaps be a guest here on Writer Talks and get published in our annual anthologies of international writers. I'm Elizabeth Ann Atkins, and I hope you can follow me on Twitter at Elizabeth Atkins and at to the number two sisters writing. So meanwhile, I'll see you next week for another edition of Writer Talks. And I wish you happy writing. We'll see you next time.